Hostem dnešních 20 minut radiožurnálu je generální tajemník Severoatlantické aliance Jens Stoltenberg. Good afternoon, Secretary General, and let me wish you all the best to your recent 60th birthday. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, recently, the Czech Republic, Poland and Hungary celebrated their uh, 20 years in NATO. What did the welcoming of these um, three Central European state former members of a Warsaw Pact mean for the alliance in the 90s? It meant a lot. Uh, the fact that uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Poland and Hungary Uh, joined uh, 20 years ago, and then uh, several other allies uh, joined uh, later on during the 90s, and also uh, yeah, uh, up till now, actually, um, has really strengthened NATO. Uh, it has uh, strengthened our collective defense, our, our shared security. Uh, it has helped to, uh, to spread democracy, um, prosperity across uh, Europe, and actually transformed the whole of Europe, which was divided in a communist bloc and a and, uh, and uh, the uh, West Europe, uh, and now we see that uh, Europe is actually growing together, and uh, we have seen economic prosperity, we have seen democracy uh, uh, strengthening uh, and, uh, and become more and more important to uh, all of Europe. Uh, all the three countries claim the membership is crucial for them, that they would not be able to defend themselves without NATO. But could NATO nowadays operate without Czech Republic and the rest of the region? The Czech Republic, as the other uh, countries that joined, uh, uh, that has uh, that have joined over the last two decades, are of great importance for uh, NATO. Uh, of course, NATO was able to operate also before they joined, but it has strengthened NATO. It has helped to to stabilize and to and to uh, uh, strengthen democracy, freedom uh, across uh, uh, Europe. I think it also has been important for the enlargement of the European Union. We, we need to know that most of these countries, they joined NATO first, and then later on, based on that, they joined uh, uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, the, Czech, the, the Czech Republic uh, contributes to NATO in many different ways. How? Um, for instance, by participating in our increased uh, presence, enhanced for presence in the Baltic uh, region, uh, air policing, Uh, but not also what you do uh, when it comes to NATO missions and operations, not least in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, you have been for many years. I know that you have suffered uh, casualties, uh, uh, and, uh, and we are extremely uh, grateful for uh, the fact that you have been there for so many years. Um, uh, we are also uh, impressed by what uh, the Czech Republic uh, has been doing in uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, helping us to train uh, Iraqi forces, uh, especially in the field of maintenance of uh, Soviet-era equipment, so, enable Iraq, uh, the local forces in Iraq, uh, to fight Daesh, uh, ISIL themselves. And then that's one of the best weapons we have against international terrorism, is to have local forces uh, able to fight terrorism. Speaking about the Czech Republic, uh, the last year you collaborated very closely with Czech General Petr Pavel as commander of military committee. How would you evaluate uh, his work for NATO? As, uh, General uh, Petr Pavel was a very uh, highly valued uh, chairman of the military committee and, uh, and uh, I appreciated very much working uh, with him. Uh, we traveled together, we worked together, uh, he chaired the military committee. And uh, that's just another example of how uh, the Czech Republic contributes, uh, has contributed in many different ways uh, to our lives. Even though it's said that your personal relationships were not the ideal one, but you both supposedly were not on the same wave, it is true? No, I had a very good uh, working relationship with him, and, uh, and uh, we traveled together. And, uh, I remember especially we had a very good visit to Afghanistan, uh, which uh, which highlighted the importance of NATO in the fight against terrorism, and also, of course, the the contributions uh, of the Czech Republic uh, to our mission in Afghanistan. Now, uh, NATO is now celebrating um, 70th anniversary. What was the biggest achievement of the alliance during this time? The biggest achievement is that we have been able to preserve a peace. Uh, the purpose, the reason why NATO was established was to uh, preserve peace uh, uh, and to safeguard freedom. And we have been able to do that uh, for the 12 founding members, but over the last decades for more and more members. You know, we, uh, as late as at the end of the Cold War, NATO had 16 members. Now we have uh, uh, 
30 members soon, as we are 29 now, but soon North Macedonia will join, so then you'll be 30 members. Uh, and, and, and the biggest success of the alliance has been that we have been able to preserve peace by providing credible deterrence, credible defense. Uh, the purpose of being strong, the purpose of investing our armed forces is not to provoke a conflict, but it is to deter a conflict. And we have to remember that uh, the leaders, the people that uh, created NATO back in 1949, uh, they have lived through uh, two world wars, uh, the First and the Second World War. And for them it was uh, of paramount importance to prevent anything like that from happening ever again. And then also saw uh, the Soviet Union, uh, communism, dictatorship taking uh, a hold on uh, Europe. For instance, uh, also the Czech Republic, or what was then Czechoslovakia, was suffered very much under under uh, Soviet uh, uh, rule and oppression. Uh, so both to preserve peace, to avoid anything like the Second World War to happen again, and to uh, stand up against communism, dictatorship, we established NATO and we have been successful in doing exactly that, preserving the peace and safeguarding freedom. And what about the mistakes? Even today the bombing of Serbia is being questioned or the speed of reaction on the onset of the Islamic State, were there any mistakes during well, this? I'm, I'm not counting mistakes, but uh, of course we will always learn lessons uh, from history, from uh, our missions and operations, from our experiences. And I think that one of the lessons we have learned from uh, Iraq uh, and the fight against Daesh is that uh, we have to always be prepared to engage in, in, in military operations to fight, for instance, uh, extremists as, as Daesh ISIL. Uh, but another lesson learned both from Af Iraq and uh, Afghanistan is the importance of training local forces. Uh, in the long run, it's more sustainable uh, and, and better in the fight against terrorism if local forces, uh, Afghan security forces in Afghanistan or the Iraqi security forces and army in Iraq, can fight terrorism themselves because we will always be foreigners, we will always come from another country. So therefore NATO is now more and more focused on how to train, how to advise uh, local forces, enabling them to stabilize their own country. And that's one of the lessons we have learned, for instance, from, from uh, uh, Afghanistan. When it comes to uh, uh, the Balkans, I think we have to remember that NATO uh, was key in helping to end two wars in the Balkans. First in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, we saw the atrocities, we saw the massacres in Srebrenica. Uh, and then we also saw violence against civilians in Kosovo. And more than a year of diplomatic efforts didn't uh, succeed, actually failed. And then we went in and helped to also end uh, the violence and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the killing of uh, civilians. And since then, it has been in Kosovo, helping to uh, provide a safe and secure uh, environment and to protect all people, including, of course, the Serbs. Hmm. Uh, speaking about the Serbia, how did you personally perceive the bombing of Serbia? You spent your childhood uh, in Belgrade uh, because your father was a Norwegian ambassador to Yugoslavia at that time in the 60s. So I have a very close relationship to uh, Serbia and to the whole of the former uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, I have very fond memories of our childhood there, and also, also when we moved back to Norway, it was a nanny from uh, Serbia that uh, actually lived with us for many years uh, and I have friends there, I've been back there many times uh, so I, I have very fond memories of, uh, of Serbia and the former Yugoslavia. Uh, during the bombing I remember I, uh, I, I spoke to uh, two uh, friends of mine uh, uh, who lived in Belgrade, who lived in Serbia um, I think it's always good to hear directly from people affected uh, what they think uh, 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 so this was not this was not an easy thing. Uh, I, I, I understand that uh, the memories of uh, uh, the uh, NATO operation back in 1999 uh, are still uh, painful in Serbia. Uh, and uh, we have to remember that the purpose of the NATO presence was to save uh, lives, uh, uh, to prevent um, violence against civilians. Any loss of uh, innocent civilian lives is a tragedy, and I have expressed my condolences to all those who lost their loved ones uh, on both sides uh, during that uh, uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. What are the current and future biggest challenges for the Alliance in your perspective? 
the main challenge is the unpredictability, the uncertainty. Uh, I think what we have learned from both uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the Russian annexation of Crimea, the rise of ISIS, or 9-11 attack, uh, attacks against the United States in 2001, is that it's very hard to predict the future, because hardly anyone was able to predict these very important uh, events uh, for the alliance. So what we have to be uh, uh, able to is uh, uh, to deal with the uh, surprises, because there will be surprises. And is NATO ready? Yes, that, and, 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 and especially because now we see a more uncertain, more uh, unpredictable security environment. Uh, uh, we have increased the readiness of forces. Uh, we have increased the presence of NATO in the eastern part of the alliance. We have implemented the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the, end of the Cold War, especially by increasing readiness, improving intelligence, surveillance, and also reforming the command structure so we are now able to move forces uh, across the Atlantic uh, more quickly. Uh, we have a new uh, uh, command both for the Atlantic and one for uh, Europe. Uh, which is especially focused on planning, exercising the movement of forces. So NATO is agile, NATO is able to react uh, much more quickly than we were just a few years ago, simply because it is a more unpredictable security environment. Hmm. You mentioned uh, Afghanistan. Uh, President Trump announced that uh, he, the United States will, will withdraw 7,000 uh, U.S. troops from Afghanistan. If it uh, is the U.S. Uh, part of the NATO training mission, will NATO also leave Afghanistan? No decision has been taken. That has been clearly stated many times from the United States on uh, the question of uh, level of U.S. presence in Afghanistan. What is going on is a, a dialogue, a peace process between uh, the United States and uh, the Taliban. Uh, the United States um, uh, is consulting very closely with NATO allies. Uh, the chief negotiator, uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Khalilzad from, also from, from the United States, he has visited NATO three times, uh, consulted closely with NATO allies, so NATO allies are involved in this process. Uh, we support the process because we are in Afghanistan to create the conditions for a peaceful and negotiated solution. Uh, and I'm absolutely certain that one reason why we now see at least some progress uh, in the peace process is that NATO has so clearly conveyed the message that we are in Afghanistan to send a message uh, to the Taliban that they will not win on the battlefield. They have to sit down and uh, reach a political uh, agreement uh, with NATO, with the United States, with the Afghan government at the negotiating uh, table. Uh, I hope, it's too early to say, but I hope, of course, that uh, uh, this process will lead to a, uh, an agreement, uh, to a ceasefire, to a negotiated political solution. Uh, and then we have made it very clear that we went into Afghanistan together, uh, all NATO allies. We will make decisions of future posture in Afghanistan together, uh, uh, because uh, we are there together to fight international terrorism. But, for example, Czech President uh, Milor Zeman constantly reiterates that it's not possible to negotiate it with terrorists. Shouldn't it be uh, the case of Taliban as well? But at the same time, I think we all have to recognize that uh, we need a political solution. We have been there now for 17 years. Uh, 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 we, there is a high price, uh, uh, human lives, uh, economic price. So, of course, at some stage, uh, we need to try to find a political solution. But there is a very close link between our military presence, our uh, presence of NATO troops, advisors, uh, trainers uh, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and our economic support to, to the Afghan army and security force, and the progress on the negotiating table. Because Taliban has to understand that we are committed, we, provide, we will uh, uh, continue to support the Afghans uh, until we see a, a deal, uh, until we see a, a peace deal. Uh, and uh, and uh, and that's that's exactly why we continue to stay uh, to create the conditions uh, for negotiated solutions. Um, the hottest topic of nowadays in NATO is the INF uh, treaty. Have you tried to persuade either President Trump or U.S. administration uh, to change their mind regarding the INF? It seemed that you have taken the U.S. Uh, uh, position into account and did not try to change it, despite the importance of the INF treaty. 
Yes, but we have to understand what, 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 what the problem is. The problem is not the United States. The problem is that we have uh, a treaty, the INF Treaty, signed in uh, 1987, banning all intermediate range weapons. Uh, over the last years, uh, Russia has violated that uh, treaty. This was first uh, raised by the Obama administration almost six years ago, uh, then by the Trump administration and all NATO allies. Uh, support uh, the U.S. determination, the U.S. assessment, uh, that Russia is in violation. And several allies have independently uh, assessed uh, that Russia is violating the treaty with new missiles, which are now have deployed over several years, SSC-8. They are nuclear capable, they are hard to detect, they are mobile, they reduce the warning time uh, uh, and therefore also the threshold of any use of nuclear weapons in, uh, in a conflict, and they can reach European cities. No arms control deal uh, work uh, if, if it's not respected. Uh, if it's only respected by one side, then it does keep us safe. Uh, there are no new US missiles in uh, Europe, but there are more and more new Russian nuclear-capable missiles in Europe. That's the problem. So the responsibility for saving the treaty uh, lies with uh, Russia. They have to come back into compliance. Uh, United States, NATO allies, NATO have called on uh, Russia again and again to come back into compliance. That's the only way to save the treaty. Uh, you said that if uh, Russia does not comply with the INF, NATO will respond appropriately. How? This is a very serious issue, issue. So we have decided that we will take our time, uh, we will consult, we will uh, analyze, assess different options before we uh, make any decision. Uh, uh, and we have to remember that the withdrawal process will take six months and was triggered in the beginning of February. So uh, until August, uh, it's possible to save the treaty. And, and do you uh, believe in it? At least we need to continue to work for it, because this treaty has been uh, so important for our security, for arms control. It's a cornerstone arms control agreement, which has been of a extreme, uh, also very big uh, importance for, uh, for all of us. Um, therefore, we need to uh, seize any opportunity to continue uh, to call on Russia to com come back into compliance, and we'll continue to do that at least until August, when uh, the withdrawal process will be uh, uh, finished. At the same time, we cannot be naive. Uh, uh, Russia has now, for almost six years, violated the treaty. Uh, allies agree on that. Uh, two US administrations agree on that. Obama and Trump administrations agree on that. Uh, so therefore, we need us to be uh, prepared for the world without the INF Treaty and with more Russian missiles in Europe. Uh, we are now assessing, uh, uh, our military commanders are looking into different options. It's too early to say what the outcome of that process will be. What I can say is that we will be measured, uh, we will be coordinated as a NATO alliance, uh, uh, we will be defensive, uh, and we don't have any intention of deploying uh, new uh, nuclear ground launch, um, uh, launched missiles in uh, Europe. Um, we don't have to mirror what Russia does, but we need to make sure that we have effective, efficient uh, deterrence and defense in Europe, also in the world uh, with more uh, new uh, Russian nuclear missiles. Speaking about the Russia, what is its goal regarding the NATO? Russia has publicly many times expressed that, that they would like to uh, 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 see a world where NATO is not longer existing, uh, to break down the alliance, uh, to, to divide us. Uh, at the same time, what we have seen is that actually NATO is stronger than it has been for many years. And uh, we see that despite uh, some differences between North America and Europe on issues like trade or climate change, in NATO we are actually doing more together than for many, many years. Uh, we have increased the readiness of our forces, we have uh, uh, deployed uh, uh, NATO troops in the eastern part of the alliance uh, with new battle groups, uh, uh, we are modernizing the command structure, and the United States uh, is increasing their presence in Europe with more forces, more exercises, more investment in infrastructure. So the reality is that we are actually standing together uh, uh, in a more unpredictable world. Uh, and, that's, and that's the strength of NATO, is that we have been able to 
uh, be united and uh, change and adapt when the world is changing. Říká pro dnešních 20 minut radiožurnálu generální tajemník NATO Jens Stoltenberg. Thank you for your answers and for being guest of the Czech Radio. Thank you so much for having me. A s vámi se loučí Filip Nerad.